study and 10 a.m. for worship, and then Thursday nights at 7 p.m. Come visit with us. We hope to see you there. Don't flex your muscles. Flex your mind. Watch a word from the Lord. Thursday nights at 9. I did for science. In the Church of Christ, we teach that the Bible teaches that we can intermarry and we, therefore we will intermingle. We'll also have a very diverse future. When I first heard about the Church of Christ and what they were teaching, they made me believe that they were actually teaching the truth. And if you're teaching the truth, there should not be an issue with black or white. So I decided to visit here and that's when I realized that they are teaching the truth and black or white, regardless of what your nationality is, is not an issue. Visit the Martinsville Church of Christ. Services 11 a.m. on Sunday, 7 p.m. on Wednesday. Watch them on TV Wednesday night at 9 p.m. on Comcast Channel 18 and Sunday night on WGSR at 9 p.m. The views expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect the views of the station, its employees, or ownership. What power? What power? After losing the debate to the KKK, Michael went to school. Just being a preacher in general is not a job for sissies. Uh, you have to have thick skin, you have to be ready to be uh, scrutinized on all points. Uh, you know, that's, that's one of the things that I believe that they were really trying to help us with, you know, in the school that I was attending, was that some of the instructors, they would, you know, they would kind of pick out some guys and they would just be really hard on them for a certain amount of time. Visit the Martinsville Church of Christ. Services 11 a.m. on Sunday, 7 p.m. on Wednesday. Watch them on TV Wednesday night at 9 p.m. on Comcast Channel 18 and Sunday night on WGSR at 9 p.m. And as the church continues to grow, people are driving miles to hear the truth. Yes, I drove an hour to get here, but it's worth it, and we try to do it every week. I think we've definitely developed a reputation here. I think folks know who we are. Uh, they're familiar with what we teach. Um, <clears throat> I think there's still a lot of territory to be covered. I think things are going wonderful. Right. And I really think that Johnny is one of the best preachers I ever heard in my life and he's got two sons that are going to follow in his steps. So I wouldn't want to be anywhere but here. Visit the Martinsville Church of Christ. Services 11 a.m. on Sunday, 7 p.m. on Wednesday. Watch them on TV Wednesday night at 9 p.m. on Comcast Channel 18 and Sunday. Good evening everyone. Welcome to A Word from the Lord. James over here with you and we are glad you are tuning in tonight. We've got a special uh, program tonight. We actually have a uh, 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 guest caller that's going to come in, and we're going to uh, talk with them uh, just momentarily. I'm going to say in about uh, 15 minutes they're going to call in, and so we want you to be ready for that. If someone that's calling, I believe, let me check. I'm not real sure. Let me check to see where they're from. Uh, it's individuals that have... Uh, found the truth as a result of uh, work uh, watching uh, the internet. They're from Kentucky and uh, uh, his name is Roy. He's going to call in and uh, we're going to be looking forward to that. But tonight, before we get started, I want you to uh, know our content information. We meet at 250 the Boulevard there in Eden, North Carolina, 27288. Uh, and uh, my number is 276-340-2653. If you want to call, uh, set up a Bible study. If you'd like to come visit with us, we've had some Visitors of late, we are really uh, encouraged by uh, what we're seeing. Uh, we're giving away this uh, book, a muscle, muscle and a Shovel, and Mark has shown that, and uh, we'll show that to you again as, uh, as time goes on. So uh, here, here it is, Muscle and a Shovel, and this is yours uh, just simply for the asking. Just give me a call or send me an email at wordfromthelord at gmail.com. And uh, we'll get you one out. If, uh, to, if you're, you're not a member of the church, this is our gift to you. Uh, if you're not a member of the Church of Christ, we want you to know that we uh, would consider it a great honor if you would, if you would accept this as, as a gift from you. No, <clears throat> no, no love gifts or no uh, love offerings or anything like that. We don't want that. We just want you to simply ask for it, you know. So... Uh, this, this is what it will take. So we, we hope that you will, will uh, take advantage of that very thing. So uh, we're, we're looking forward to uh, uh, these, uh, uh, this call coming in, and we're going to get into our lesson. Uh, actually, we've got some, uh, wanted to give our, our times a Bible study, 9 a.m. 
uh, for Bible study, 10 a.m. for worship on Sunday is where we meet, Thursdays at uh, 7 o'clock for Bible study. Uh, I want to remind you of, uh, of course, in Martinsville, 823 Starting Avenue and 120 American Legion in Danville, and you uh, uh, can get in touch with uh, Johnny or Micah or Mark, uh, and uh, they'd be glad to assist you. And what does the Bible say coming on WHIGTV.com after this program? Uh, go over and log in to whigtv.com if you're watching online. Uh, you can probably open another tab. I don't know how, what kind of uh, operating system you have, but you can probably open another tab. And go ahead and get that ready, and then you can just click over there and watch Micah. Micah is going to be doing a live program tonight from Rocky Mount on whigtv.com, and uh, this is going to be starting uh, starting tonight. This is the first night, and Brother Johnny Robertson is going to be doing that uh, on every Thursday night at 10 o'clock. Go from 10 to 11:30. So. Uh, friends, there's just ample opportunity for you to study God's Word. We want to, you know that as your friends in the Church of Christ, we're giving to this, bringing this to you free of charge. We never ask you for any money. We want you to take advantage of it. And if we can assist you in any way we can. Friends, this is why we do this. This is why we do this. Our, our goal is, is to duplicate uh, the church that you read about in the first century. As a matter of fact, in our, in our Bible studies on Sunday mornings, and we went over some of it uh, tonight as well, since I taught class. Uh, but uh, we've been going through the book of Acts. And friends, the book of Acts is just a, a, a blueprint. It's a pattern. It's an outline for how to duplicate the church of Christ. And so what we're, what we're doing is we're going through the Bible and we're finding out how did the church in the first century operate and what can we do then to uh, emulate that or to, to, uh, uh, to reproduce that very thing. And so the book of Acts is that pattern we're, we're uh, going through. And so... What we're trying to do is do that very thing. The Bible is our guideline. The Bible is our pattern. And so what we're trying to do is simply plant the seed of the kingdom, which is the word of God, Luke 8 and verse 11. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to sow that seed and so we can find the same church you find in the first century. And friends, the one way that you can find if you have found the true church, the church you read about in the Bible, is by simply going to the book and finding out, you know what, is this, is this like what they did in the first century? Is, is what they're doing in the church that, that I'm in, is it lined up with what the Bible says? Is it identical in, in, in pattern? You know, if you, uh, if you line it up, is it, is it identical? Does it look close? Or is it identical? I mean, it may be close. There may be some things they're doing. But friends, you've got to make sure that what you are believing, what you're hearing, what you're following is indeed the word of the Lord. And so that's why we're bringing you uh, programs like What Does the Bible Say and A Word from the Lord is because we want you to find the church that you read about in the Bible. Now, I want you to notice something. The way we're going to do that is we're going to look and see, well, what did they do then? And does it line up with what people are doing now? Because if what people are doing now is not, what, is not anything like what they did then, friends, you'll know that you're not in the New Testament church. Let's look at some things. What did they do then? We're just going to look at some thens and some nows. Then and now. Then. Back then, the first century church, they preached a controversial doctrine. It was a doctrine that, that, stirred, that stirred everybody up. Notice this, for example. In Acts chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, the Bible says, The priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection of the dead. Now that word grieved actually means pained or anguished. It was causing them all kinds of grief. I mean, it was, you know, it was, it was uh, uh, causing them to pop the, pop the rollage or the tums, you know. It was giving them some, some grief. It was, it was making them angry. It was upsetting them because they were preaching the, the resurrection of the dead. Now, the Sadducees... Uh, they, would, they would definitely have grief for this because it was contrary. It was contrary to what they believed. Now, you know, when something is controversial, when it goes against the grain or when it goes against the norm or maybe it's politically incorrect, that's controversial. And it's controversial because it's not popular with everybody. And so the individuals that don't like it, they cause a big ruckus. Notice again, it's the Sadducees. In Matthew 22, verse 23, the Bible says the same day came unto Jesus, came unto him the Sadducees, which, now notice, which say that there is no resurrection. So 
when, if they don't believe there's a resurrection, then when you, someone comes along and preaches something contrary to that, oh, boy, it's going gonna, it's gonna to ruffle some feathers. It's going to stir, stir the pot, right? Well, friends, that's exactly, that's exactly what we need to be doing. We need to go back and just preach the, preach the word. And it may be controversial. Friends, it may be controversial. But that doesn't change the truth. You see, we don't change the truth because it's upsetting. If someone doesn't like the fact that, you know, that we're teaching that there's only one kind of church in the Bible, it's the church of Christ. Friends, don't, don't get mad at me. Don't say, well, y'all just too controversial. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Is that really, is that really the criteria here? Is that really why we need to tone it down? Because it's upsetting somebody? Because it's controversial? I want you to look at this. In Acts chapter 19, uh, in Acts, uh, chapter, <clears throat> Acts chapter 19, and uh, we're going to start about verse uh, 20 here. I'm about 23. 23. Listen to what the Bible says. Now, Paul's in Ephesus here. And the Bible says, In the same time there arose no small stir about that way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, uh, a silversmith that made silver shrines for Diana brought no small gain to the craftsmen whom he called together uh, with the workmen of the like occupation and said, Sirs, ye know that by this craft we have our wealth. That's how we make our money. He says, Moreover, ye see and hear that not alone in Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that there be no gods which made with hands. And so that not only this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia, whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. And when they heard these things, now notice this, and when they heard these things, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. You know what I've noticed? Back then... Back then when they preached the gospel and Paul came, comes along and he's preaching that, you know, there's this, this religion that you're worshiping is it's false religion. It got everybody upset. But you know what? They didn't debate it. They didn't debate the merits of how, why Diana is such a great goddess. They didn't prove that she was a, that she was a, a true god. They didn't defend the, their religion. You know what they did? They simply cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. That was their best argument. That's their best argument. You know what? That kind of reminds me of people today. Today, we preach a controversial, a controversial message because what we're saying is there's only one kind of church in the Bible or we preach that, that individuals should, should obey a, the gospel, but people today say, well, you know what? That's too controversial. But their best argument is their best argument is really not an argument at all. Their best defense is not a defense at all. What people today do when they hear a, a, a controversial uh, doctrine, a message preached like what we're preaching, they say, they say no, we're going to preach a non-confrontational doctrine. And they say, well, you just need to just preach Jesus. Just preach Jesus. You know, just preach the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That's not going to offend anybody, you know. Friends, that's not controversial. That's not a controversial message today. Not, not in America, it's not. Now, if you go over into a Muslim country, it may be controversial to preach uh, uh, the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But I submit, to you that there, I submit to you there's a lot of individuals today that could go over into a Muslim country and preach Jesus, and they wouldn't be stoned for it because they'd be so non-distinctive. They'd be so... Uh, 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 be so watered down and so uh, weak that they couldn't preach the gospel of any definitiveness or distinctiveness to where someone who's a Muslim would know that what they're saying is that you've got to give up Islam. As a matter of fact, I know that some of the more popular preachers won't even preach that. They pre it's not a controversial to them. Look at this. Look at this. Here's, here's Billy Graham. Here's an article uh, on Billy Graham, and here's what he says. Here's what Billy Graham says. Billy Graham says, he won't talk politics. He says, at my age, now listen, at my age, I have one message that Jesus Christ 
came, he died on the cross, rose again, and asked us to repent of our sins. Oh, that's real controversial there, isn't it, Billy? That's really controversial. As a matter of fact, but in the, this, is, this is kind of an old article now. He's actually toned it down even more than that. He said you don't even have to know Jesus. You don't even have to know the name of Jesus and you can still be heaven, in heaven. Boy, that is so nondescript. That, that's universalism, friends. That's basically saying that God's going to save everybody. You don't have to know anything. You don't have to do anything. That's an easy, easy message to preach. But yet we come along and say no. Beyond a, without any shadow of a doubt, you have to obey the gospel or you're going to be lost. Now, that may be controversial to some people, but we're still going to preach it. See, then the message was controversial. Then the message got people stirred up. It made them angry, not because people are trying to be made mad, but because the nature of the message is controversial. See, and so back then it was controversial, but now people in the denominational world, they, they want to tone it down. But we, we're still controversial. We're still controversial because the message that we preach, friends, is going to go against what most people believe. Now, this is a, this is a, a interview, part of an interview from, man, I don't know when it was. It's probably uh, 2000. Maybe 2001, I'm going to say 2000, and uh, listen to what uh, what says. Okay, I'm going to take this phone call. Just a second. Get volume. Would y'all think, would y'all go with that? Well, it's not, it's not a brag. It is just... Is the truth? Yes, the truth is controversial, yes. And we... We back the truth, so therefore there's no way to get away from being controversial. Okay. All right, play it one more time. Back live here, Cable Six. With um, two, y'all like this when I said two of the most controversial ministers in town? Would y'all think? Would y'all go with that? Well, it's not. It's not a brag. It is just. Is the truth? Yes, the truth is controversial. Yes, and we we back the truth, so therefore there's no way to get away from being controversial. Okay. All right, so, 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 so Charles says. So uh, uh, no, tell him I want, I want, I want Roy. I want you to call back in. I, I'm, I'm gonna take your phone call now. See, no, my, no, this was a long time ago. Charles said, you know, are y'all controversial ministers, friends? It's not a brag. It's not a boast. It's not something that that we strive for. But it's just the nature of the message. It's controversial because it goes against what most people are going to believe. Jesus was a controversial preacher. He came on the scene preaching that what the religious people that they were doing was not right, that they need to repent. That's a controversial message. That's a controversial message. And so, and so friends, what we're, what we're trying to say is back then it was controversial. Now, if you, if you go and you're worshiping in a, in a place... And the message is so uh, meek and uh, weak, not really meek, but weak, that it's non-distinctive and everybody always feels good and it's just, you know, it's just, uh, it's never going to ruffle any kind of feathers. Friends, you need to consider, is this the same message that we, that we, that we read about in the New Testament? Is this the same gospel message that we find back then? See, we're trying to duplicate the same thing, the same message. The same message will be just as controversial. It'll be just as feather ruffling uh, uh, today as it was back then. Okay? So, so uh, uh, you know, we want, we want you to realize this. We don't want you to scrutinize and find out uh, uh, what, what it is that we're, that, that we're looking for. All right? Now, back then, let's move on to another one. Uh, now, back then... Is this, is this my line right here? Back then, they preached boldly. They preached and taught boldly. And that word boldly means all with all uh, uh, outspokenness, frankness, bluntness, if you will, uh, publicly uh, uh, assurance. They were, they, were, they were confident in what they preached. You know, sometimes, friends, 
we get we get uh, we get told we are just arrogant. No, friends, it's not arrogance. It's just confidence. It's confidence in knowing that what we're saying is true. And it's passion for knowing that what we are saying is true and that what people need to do is obey what they say, what, what we're saying, what the Bible is, is telling them to do. That's, that's what it is. It's not, cock, it's not cockiness. It's simply being certain that people don't misunderstand what's being said. Notice this. In Acts 28 and verse 31, Acts 28 and verse 31. Let's, let me just put this up for us to read. I don't think you can read my... Uh, Acts 28, verse 31, the Bible says that Paul was preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. All right? So he was preaching with confidence. Uh, Roy, I don't have your phone number. I don't have your phone number, brother, so I, I want you to uh, call me back. Uh uh, I guess uh, R Richard, go ahead and just put the phone lines up. Maybe uh, he may have not might not have the phone number. Uh, but notice, Paul was preaching. He was confident. He's preaching with confidence, friends. That's what we're talking about. It means to, to be to be plain, so that no one can misunderstand it. Now, friends, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to make sure that when we preach the gospel, people don't don't misunderstand it. You know, we're not trying to mince words. We're trying to get down to the uh, uh, as the old timers just say, we're trying to shell the corn down where you can see the cob. You know, we want to make it so plain that you just cannot miss it. That you cannot miss it. That's what we're talking about. A plain message in uh, um, Acts four and verse ten. Acts four and verse ten. When you look at the at the message of the apostles, look at this. Peter says. In no uncertain terms. All right. Peter says in no uncertain terms. He says, be it known to you all, to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. So by you, he, he said, you crucified. You crucified him. All right. So now we know, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Peter's audience got the point. You killed Christ. All right, I have, I have uh, uh, Roy's phone number, so I'm going to call him. Stay with me right here. And let's see if we can hear him here. All right. Are you getting volume in there? Richard, Hello. Hello. is this Roy? This Roy. Roy, the James Oldfield, you're on, you're on work from the Lord. How are you doing tonight? Oh, I'm doing good, sir. I'm glad to hear from you. Glad to hear from you, too. I got a, a text message from uh, Brother Johnny, and he was telling me uh, something about what you were, uh, I guess maybe how you, ca how you came to know the truth. Why don't you tell, why don't you tell the audience here what we're... Um, you know, uh, uh, kind of your story, I guess. Okay, well, here's my story. Uh, my wife and I were in the Pentecostal church, and we were real sold out to it, and uh, we're real active in the church and everything, and it just kind of felt like something was always a little bit off. And when I would read Corinthians right in the beginning, it spoke about how there's not supposed to be any divisions among the brethren. And, and that really bothered me because I was in a division, a denomination. So that thought to me, and that couldn't just be explained away. And uh, so basically that was a big thing. And the whole thing about baptism, I really agree with what you all say, because that's what the Bible says. And I was watching John Roberts and maybe like a week ago. I started watching them, and everything has made perfect sense. And what's so great about it is you all don't interpret the Bible. You just read the Bible. It doesn't need to be interpreted and, and twisted to form some sort of way to make this theory work or that theory. You just read it straight out, and when you do that, that's when you find yourself. We've come out of the denomination of uh, being Pentecostal, and we're now in the Church of Christ. All right, so uh, how long were you in the Pentecostal Church? We were in 
Pentecostal church for two years. And before that, we were just kind of floundering around. We weren't really serious about anything before that. Okay. Growing up, did, were you, did you have any kind of religious affiliation, like your parents' religion or anything like that? Yeah, I grew up uh, in a Calvary Chapel church when I was young, which is a non-denominational church. And then I went to the Baptist church through my teenage years. And then after that, I really didn't go to church until now. I'm 34 now, so when I was about 32, we got back into it. Well, why, do you, why do you think that you were going from from all from place to place i mean what, what was it about what do you think it was that these these denominations were not giving you what were you i mean obviously there was something that was missing here i mean why why didn't you stay in those denominations i guess i guess i didn't stay in those denominations because it just seemed like it didn't feel right with my spirit and they also asked me for money every time i turn around they want my money they want my money for this. They want my money for that. They want my money for the 10% tithing. They say that's just the beginning is your 10% tithing. And then your offerings come. Your offerings for this building fund, for their organization, for their headquarters, for money to fund their organization. And, you know, I went to dinner with my pastor at Church of Christ here Sunday. Well, I went to church Sunday, and that's the first time I met him. And he said, can I take you and your wife to lunch? I said, sure. He bought my lunch with the it blew my socks off because usually when I'm around a pastor, they want my money. He bought me lunch, and then I said, Pastor, I, or minister, I said, why didn't you ask for money this morning at church? They did pass around the, the offering plate, but he didn't ask for any money. He said, I'm never going to ask you for money. I don't want your money. He said, you do what Jesus said and give as your heart tells you. I said, so you don't tell us we got to pay 10% off the top? He said, no, and the Bible doesn't tell you you need to either. And I didn't even know what to think. I almost passed out. How about that? Well, you know, Roy, I'm, I, I, this is this is just thrilling my my soul to hear this because this is, you know, this is what we're trying to get individuals to see that if they would simply examine, and this is what our show's about tonight. You know, we want people to examine what what they've been taught and just compare it to the Bible, you know, and just see if it matches up. So, um, uh, so. Did you did you did you study with these individuals, or did you just watch the YouTube videos and and you came to obey the gospel, or you are you still just visiting with the church, or did you obey the gospel? Oh, as far as getting baptized, yes, sir. I haven't got baptized yet. We really we just went there Sunday, and we went to a service Tuesday night and Wednesday night last night, and uh, we haven't got baptized yet, but we're going to get baptized in the Church of Christ. Okay. Well, that's, and this is what, you know, this is what we're trying to get people to realize too is, you know, the Bible says come out and then the Lord will add you to his church. You know, man votes on you or they do whatever they want to do to get you to be a member of man's church. But when you become a member of the Lord's church, you know, the Lord is the one who makes you the member. And that's, that's, a, uh, that's kind of a unique uh, uh, thing about the Lord's church is no one... Uh, you know, there's no membership requirements placed upon you by man. It's just, it's all done by Christ. So I hope, I hope and pray that, that you will not delay. You know, if you realize that the, that the church you, that you found is the church that you read about in the Bible, Roy, I would, I would tell you to call the preacher up tonight and, uh, you know, even if it's midnight, I mean, if I can encourage you in that regard, uh, in, in Acts chapter 16, Paul baptized a man at midnight. And uh, we have done that several times here. You know, just people call up in the middle of the night or, you know, we've been studying with them or it goes into the night or whatever. And, uh, uh, you know, if he if he's a gospel preacher and, I, and what you're saying to me, you know, that's, that's that sounds like it. You know, he'll meet you and he'll baptize you uh, at midnight if that's, if that's, you know, if that's what it takes. But don't delay. I mean, Paul would say, why tarest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. So I, I'm encouraged by your call, but I want to encourage you back if I could do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, we were baptized. I don't think that you would count this, though. I mean, my wife and I both were baptized when we were uh, 13 years old or 14, I guess, when we reached the age of accountability as far as our churches. Um, but we didn't do it. We didn't get baptized through the Church of Christ. So, did, did that, oh, I'm sorry, my wife was. My wife was. 
Your yeah, wife? wife grew up church, but I didn't mention that. My wife grew up church, but. Okay. Well, let me encourage you on this. Let me just, I don't know, are you looking at the TV? Are you looking at, can you see my, can you see the screen? Uh, no, sir, I'm actually not, uh, I'm not home okay. right now. I'm on the way home. Okay, well, in Acts 19, I'm going to give you this scripture. You look at it in Acts 19. In Acts 19, Paul met some individuals that had been baptized, but it turns out that their baptism was John's baptism. They listened to Apollos preaching, and he was telling them to be baptized for the remission of sins, but his baptism was no longer valid, even though it was a, a, a baptism that God had told him to preach. And so, but, but John's baptism looked forward to Christ. And so in Acts 19... Paul asked them, he says, well, unto what were you baptized? They said, John's baptism. And then he said unto them, Paul said, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So what that tells us is someone may be baptized, but that doesn't mean they were baptized correctly. In other words, you can't be baptized wrong and then, or can't be taught wrong and baptized correctly. So you're right in, in saying that, you know, any baptism that you had previously, you know, your baptism wasn't valid because that baptism actually puts you into a, a, a Pentecostal church or a Baptist church or a community church. But it wasn't the Lord's church. So, put me into a church that wasn't the Lord's church that you're right. That's exactly not right. <laughs> so, you know, it's kind of like saying, well, I went through a door. Well, you might have gone through the door, but you didn't get into my house. You know, you went into a door right. and got to your house. So right. just because you walked through a door, that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean anything. That just, that just means you went through a door. But to get into the yeah. Lord's church, baptism is the door. Galatians 3, 26 and, 20, uh, 26 and 27. So uh, I, I would encourage you to do that. I'm going to get on it, brother. Yeah, I'm sorry. I said I'm gonna I'm gonna get on that and get that. I'm gonna I'm gonna get on that right away. Okay. Well, I I would I would like to hear from you and keep in touch with you. Okay, brother. Do you want me to call you when I get baptized? Maybe next week. That'd be great. That'd be great. Let us know, text or email or phone call or carrier pigeon, whatever. We just we'd like to know. All right, Brother James, I appreciate you. All right. Well, you take care and have a good night. You too, see you. All right. Now, now people, this is, this is what we're talking about. This is a, an, an excellent uh, example of someone, of someone who uh, is looking for the truth, and uh, I, I trust that he's going to fall through this. I, I really believe he's going to. So uh, this is what we want you to see. See, friends, what we're saying to you is not, it's not meant to rile or to agitate, but it might. You know, it might stir you up. It might agitate you a little bit. But that's not our intent. That's just the nature of the gospel. That's the nature of the gospel. Back then, back then, the message, it agitated a little bit. It rubbed people the wrong way. But that's because it was a truth. It was contrary to what they had been taught previously. Let's look again at another, at another verse. In Acts 5 and verse 28, Acts 5 and verse 28, I want you to notice how, how pointed, how pointed and how blunt, and how plain Peter's uh, message was. All right? Now, here's what the people, here's what the people said to Peter and John. They said, did we not straightly command you that you should not teach in his name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine." Now, friends, that's what a lot of people would like for us to do. They want to say, y'all need to stop. You know, they, I, I bet Charles gets a call a week, probably. I don't know. I, I've heard several calls. People say, you know, y'all just need to get the Church of Christ off the air, get Johnny Robertson off the air, and James off the air. You know what, friends? What's, what's bothering you is the message. And they said, you have filled Jerusalem with a doctrine, but notice this, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. You're right. That's exact. You got it. Folks, you got the message. You understood loud and clear. Peter said, Peter said, uh, 
You crucified him. You're on the air. This is the word from the Lord. Uh, this is James. Yeah, you're on the air. You're live on TV. Oh, I'm just, I'm just calling in to uh, check on your uh, schedule. Uh, sort of lost track uh, of you. Okay, my, our schedule. Uh, our TV, yes. our TV schedule. We come on at nine o'clock on Thursday night. Our worship schedule. We meet at nine o'clock on Sunday mornings for Bible study and ten o'clock for worship. Okay, it's nine o'clock on Thursday nights. Thur Thursday nights at seven o'clock. Okay, uh, is your uh, you're not available for uh, Time Warner anymore, though, right? Yes, we are. We are. You have to get one of those special boxes that they're giving away. Let me call me back after the program. Unless you, if you got a Bible question, I'll answer it now. But if not, call me back after the program. Okay. Thank okay. You. All right. Thank you. All right. All right. So, friends, you see that Peter Peter's message was you crucified him, and they said you're trying to bring this man's blood upon our hands. You're trying to say that we killed him. That's exactly what I'm saying. You know, friends say, well, y'all saying that there's only one, that you've got to be in the church of Christ to be saved. Thank you very much. I'm glad that you got the message. See that? Now, friends, if I tiptoe around it and say, well, you know, I believe this and that, but you can just do what you want to do, that's not helping anybody out, friends. That's, that's not helping anybody out. They got the message. Peter said, you crucified him. They said, you're, you're, you're accusing us of crucifying him. That's exactly what I'm saying. All right? And so the message was, was plain and pointed. And I tell you, friends, it cut them, it cut them to the quick. It, it cut them down. Notice this. Uh, in, in, in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2 and verse 37, notice this. When they heard Peter's message, they said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They were pricked in their heart. They were pricked in their heart. And said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Some individuals, when they hear the plain message, are going to be cut to the heart. Now, that's what it was back then. Back then, they heard messages that were plain, pointed, blunt, frank. You know, they were just, it, it was just, I don't know how to describe it. So, why not, why not look for that same message? Why not look for preaching that's just the exact same way? In Acts 7, verse 54 now, the same message, that is the message that you killed Christ. I want you to look at this. This is how it affected these individuals. Acts 7. Acts 7 and verse 54. Stephen is preaching and he says, you killed him. You killed the Christ. But when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and gnashed on him with the teeth. Now, friends, depending on you and depending on your love for the truth, it's going to depend on how you react to the truth. But back then, their message was, without a shadow of a doubt, people got the message. And some people got mad, and some people got glad, and some people were sad. But no doubt about it, they got the message. Now, friends, we do people a disservice. Let me talk to members of the church for a minute. Brethren, we do people a disservice if we are not plain, bold, blunt, and distinctive when it comes to their soul salvation. With all the love in my heart, with all the love in my heart, I want to tell you what you need to hear. Now, if you get mad, don't say that I'm preaching controversial. Don't say that I'm being mean. Don't say that I'm bigoted or hateful. No, that's not the case at all. As a matter of fact, I love you enough to tell you the truth. Back then, their messages were plain. Back then, it was, it was pointed. It made some people mad and made some people glad. But people still got the message. Now, friends, if I'm going to preach like they did back then, I'm going to have to do the same thing. But you know what today? Today, these so-called preachers, these, these so-called pastors and ministers and bishops in these churches of men, they're churches of men because they're not the churches of Christ, but what they do is they don't want to make anybody feel bad. They don't want to cause guilt. They don't want to provoke people and say, well, you know what, uh, you, you, uh, you've done something wrong. No, contrary. 
what they want to do is they they want to make you feel you know somewhat good about it. They don't want to hurt your feelings. Listen to uh, Mr. Joel Osteen here. Listen carefully to what he says. He is going to tell us. He's going to tell us that he uh, has a style of message that he wants people to know, and he's not going to make them feel bad. You know, he does not want to make them feel bad at all. All right. Let's listen to what he says. Things like that. What can I do to lift their spirits? I believe there's enough pushing people down already. So when people leave one of our services or read one of my books, I want them to leave saying, you know what, I can be better. I can rise higher. So I think it's just trying to speak to somebody one-on-one, -on -one, not speaking down to them. I mean, I was raised in a, in, in my father was a great minister. He didn't speak down to the people. But in the old days, church, you know, you went to church to know what you're doing wrong. And you left there thinking, oh, man, I am so yeah, guilty. I can't do right. And, you, and you're pushed down. But I see it just that you, and you're pushed down. But I see it just the opposite. Oh, man, I am so yeah, guilty. I can't do right. And you, in the old days, church, you know, you went to church to know what you're doing wrong. And you left there thinking, oh, man, I am so yeah, guilty. I can't do right. And you, and you're pushed down, but I see it just it? the opposite to know what you're doing wrong. And you left there thinking, oh, man, I am so yeah, guilty. I can't do right. And, you, and you're pushed down, but I see it just the opposite. I want people to leave saying, you know what? I can be a better father this week. I can Sam, be a better employee. I can, I can accomplish I my dream. So, I don't know. It's something about just speaking to, you know, the seeds of greatness that God's placed in all of us. Brother, let me ask you a question because... I don't want these people to feel guilty, you know? I, I, I'm not about trying to make these people feel guilty. Friends, that's exactly what we're trying to make you feel like. You ought to feel guilty. You ought to feel guilt that you crucified the Son of God. That's what Peter would say. You ought to feel guilt that what you're doing is living contrary to the gospel of Christ. You ought to feel guilt that you're sinning. You know? Now, if we let this play, and I, I guess probably I should let this play, you know, here's, here's the message. Oh, if you do that, listen, you're going to tell people you're going to use the, the S word here. And I'm having a really hard time hearing this video clip. Can you crank the volume up on me, please? When you came on Piers Morgan show a while ago, he asked you about homosexuality, sure. Christianity, homosexuality. And almost every time we have a pastor on, it's a conversation we have. And you, you are known for these uplifting ceremony uh, services, and you talk to a lot of, it's like 45,000 people who attend. And I always wonder when you are, you say homosexuality is a sin, and there's a bunch of people who clearly are, are gay who are, it's, are in your church. You're calling them sinners. I mean, that... Well, so that... Oh, how, how terrible to call them sinners. I mean, if you, when you say something's a sin, you call people sinners. Well, yeah, you know, God forbid that we call anybody a sinner. You know? Please, let it, you know, let's, by all means, don't call anybody a sinner. Now, if I say something's a sin and you're partaking in that sin, then yes, you're a sinner. Now, friends, is that so mean? Is that so mean? But, but preachers, they don't want to do that. They don't want to do that. Listen, listen, here's what we have. Here's Billy Graham again. Here's Billy Graham again. Graham said that he could recall the conversation and sought forgiveness and reconciliation. Now, he's talking about toward Jews. He said... Uh, racial prejudice, anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism, hatred of hatred of Jews or hatred of anyone. I'm, I'm not. I'm saying that word right. Can't get it. But with, with different beliefs, has no place in the human mind or heart. Jewish leaders, many of whom appreciated his support of Israel and his refusal to join with other evangelicals in calls for the conversion of Jews accepted his apology. Billy Graham never called for the conversion of Jews. Now, friends, that's not the message that Peter got. That's not the message Paul got. Acts 4 verse 12, Jesus, uh, Peter said, Neither is there salvation in the other, for there is no other name given unto heaven among men whereby we must be saved. So the Jews would need to be converted. I guess they didn't get that message. You want a word from the Lord? Hey, James, I just wanted to say, you know, first off, that it was great to hear um, at the beginning um, part of the show, uh, I think his name was Roy, um, about his decision to come out of the Pentecostal church and just everything that you've been talking about tonight about provoking somebody. Um, I know you and Johnny had touched on 
this a little bit uh, on the Sunday show you guys did a week or so ago. Um, but, you know, many of the people who, when you guys, you know, when I obeyed the gospel, um, I was mad. You know, when I, when I was driving trucks, I threw my Bible out the, uh, out the window um, down in Texas, and, you know, I was just mad. But, you know, I started studying, and, and if people would just start studying, it, it is going to make you mad. It wasn't that I was mad at you guys. Uh, personally, I was just mad at what was being taught because it went against everything I'd ever been taught. Right. So you know, I just hope that the community would just listen. You know, and I'm glad to hear that there is somebody out there who has been listening. Right, right. That's exactly right. Well, well, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Like I said, like you, like you said, it's not it's not our intent to make people mad, but it's just the nature of the message. You know, when it pricks their heart, uh, if you want to get mad at somebody, get mad at the guy who taught you wrong. You know, that's right. That, that's who you ought to get mad at. All right. Well, I appreciate your call. Not a problem. All right. So yeah, you know, that's the that's the nature of it. Now, so Billy Graham wouldn't convert the Jews. You know, he's not going to tell them they need to convert. I wonder I wonder if some of these local preachers around here would. Here's Mr. J.C. Richardson uh, uh, in the Apostolic Church. Would he convert the Jews? Listen to what he says. They'll say that they are New Testament, but, you know, you cannot really understand all of the New Testament if you separate out the Old Testament. Jesus was a Jew. I heard Brother Robinson say when he had the Muslim brother on here that he does not support Jews. You can't say that you are a follower of Jesus and don't support Jews. That's just like saying you love Martin Luther King, but you hate black folk. You know, you can't do that. Jesus came through the lineage of Abraham and David. He was from the tribe of Judah. And so he was Jew through and through. And the first Christians, I'm going to deal with that were Jews. And, uh, and so just as the Jews evangelized uh, the Gentiles, it is now time for the Gentiles to evangelize the Jews. But Jesus was a Jew. I heard Brother Robinson say when he had the Muslim brother on here that he does not support Jews. You can't say that you are a follower of Jesus and don't support Jews. You can't say that you are a follower of Jesus and don't support Jews. You can't say that you are a follower of Jesus and don't support Jews. All right, you can't say you're a follower of Jesus and not support the Jews. Well, Paul didn't support the Jews, not like he's talking about. He didn't support them in the sense of that thinking they're God's chosen people. As a matter of fact, what Paul did and what Peter did, they actually targeted the Jews for conversion. Paul himself gave up the Jews' religion. He said in Galatians 1, Galatians 1 and verse 13, notice he said, I profited in the Jews' religion, not, not my own religion. He said in the time past in the Jews' religion, how, how beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited in the Jews' religion above many mighty uh, equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the tradition of my father. He was in the Jews' religion, but he came out of the Jews' religion. He was, he was converted. He did, he did not stay in the Jews' religion. Now, my, my, what I wonder is, what I wonder is, would people today, are they, is it bad to be uh, uh, that, that pointed in your preaching? I mean, Paul targeted individuals when he went uh, preaching. He was looking for a certain group of people that he was going to preach to first. In Acts 13, verse 46, Acts 13 and verse 46, notice this. When Paul started preaching, he said Paul, that Paul and Barnabas waxed bold. Now, here's that word again. He waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken unto you, but seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentile. He's talking to the Jews. He said, You are, are saying that you are not worthy of everlasting life. Paul didn't judge them that way. He said, You judge yourself. You judge, you're judging yourself. So all you individuals that, that say that we condemn everybody... Listen to what Paul says. Paul says when you don't obey the gospel, you actually judge yourself. Now look in the mirror and tell someone to stop judging. Friends, that's what we want you to do. We want you to stop judging yourself so unworthy of everlasting life. Come out of the denomination and become a member of the Lord's church. So Paul singled out. He, he specified who he was looking for. So did Peter in Acts 15 verse 7. Notice this in Acts 15 in verse 7. 
He said, uh, Peter rose up and said, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Peter went to the Gentiles. He went specifically to the Gentiles. Paul went to the Jews. Paul went to the Gentiles. Peter went to the Gentiles. Peter went to the Jews. And they were targeting them for conversion. But Billy Graham won't do that. J.C. Richardson won't do that. Is that the kind of preaching you want? You ought to work from the Lord. Uh, yes, sir. My name is uh, Jeff, and I was just calling in. Um, I'm a Christian. Um, have been for, I don't know, five or ten years. Um, I am a member of a Baptist church. And I just wanted to speak for a second, and uh, I just wanted to say that if if we were to say that everyone watching your show okay. believed in Christ, then I would say what you're doing is great. However, when I watch your show, when I flip the channel and and I and I came upon it, I started watching it, and you know it's. To me, you show people arguing. You show Christians arguing with other Christians. You show different religions arguing. And I don't believe that's the way Christ would have us reach other people for him. Okay, all right. I, okay. I, just, felt, I just felt called to, to say that. And okay. Can we, let's have I, a little dialogue here. What, what is it about, you said, you, you said all these Christians, what Christians have I showed arguing with other Christians? Well, <laughs> like I said, any time I have ever flipped through your show or the other one, I can't even remember uh, the gentleman's name. Uh, Johnny. Johnny Robertson. Mm -hmm. Johnny Robertson. It's, it seems very argumentative. Okay. And, and that, that's, you know, I'm not trying to... To say that you're not a Christian, so don't please don't think I'm saying that. That's um, fine. I, I, I can. But, I, I got I got tough skin. Right, right. That's great. But um, you know, basically, it it always seems argumentative every time. Okay. Well, let me ask you this though: there, Have you you said you were thumbing through? So did so you had you didn't see all the program? Not this one. No, okay. no, no well, I have not. Because at the very first this program, the, the very first point I made was how argumentative, controversial, the gospel really was. Now, well, you said... Je now, I will wait agree minute, with you no, wait, 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 You said Jesus... There was, you said Jesus... That there was arguing, that there right. was arguing and bickering okay. in the biblical days. Absolutely. 100. Okay, but here's the thing, sir. Disciples. All right, but I'm running out of time, so I want to I want to okay, do a little dialogue in here. Jesus, Jesus was argumentative. There's no... I mean, have you really looked at Jesus, has his life, and seen all the debates that he had? I mean, he was constantly going back and forth with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leaders, calling them hypocrites, whited sepulchers, snakes. I mean, that's you know that's that's pretty argumentative, I guess, if you want to use that definition. But yet, right. our Lord did it, and He did it to get the people to see that these guys that they were following were not really teaching them the true way of God. And so that's what, what we're showing you. I mean, when Billy Graham, for example, I don't know if you saw, if you saw the, uh, the article that I showed, Billy Graham is so non-controversial. As a matter of fact, I didn't show this. Let me just read this to you, and you tell me what you think about, about this. Billy Graham said that he would not target Muslims. Now, do you think Muslims are lost? Do I think they're lost? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Well, this is what now. This is what Billy Graham says. Billy Graham said. Um, uh, Tony Snow asked him. He said, "There's been some controversy in Chicago because the Southern Baptist Convention has announced plans to send evangelists into uh, into that city, Chicago, to try to convert Jews and Muslims. Is that the sort of thing the Baptist Convention should be doing?" And Billy Graham said, "I'm a Southern Baptist." I normally defend my denomination, but I have never targeted Muslims. I have never targeted Jews. I believe that we should declare the fact that God loves you, God's willing to forgive you, God can change you, and Christ and His kingdom is open to anybody who repents 
and by faith received him as Lord and Savior. Now, do you think that you should target individuals, a group of individuals who are lost and say, you know, let's, let's get specific about what you believe and show how it's wrong? Do you think Billy Graham was right or wrong on that? Well, I have two different ways of looking at it. One, one thing is he is in the public eye. And all the I more think reason when you're when you're in the public eye, you have to be extremely careful about how you word things. And maybe he did not word that correctly. Okay. Well, I could I, I could play you a I video clip. Where, that I, could, I, I I'm on this earth, and that that God has okay. blessed me so much. Okay. I know what God can well, do in your life, and I think that. Let, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Anybody, I, I can't. Okay, I'm, I'm kind of running out of time. I've got about a, a minute left here. So I want to ask you another question here. I could show you where Billy Graham actually says you don't even have to know Jesus to be saved. You've never, you can never even heard of Jesus and be saved. Yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't have the same faith I have then. Okay, I, I, all right. So, so, but what I'm saying is now you just contradicted another Christian, so to speak. Do you think Billy Graham's a Christian? I, I, honestly, I don't know. I, I've never paid a whole lot of attention to Billy Graham. To okay. Well, he's he's pretty well known, but I'm just saying. I know he's I know he's you, well known. You said he doesn't have the same faith as you do. So this is what I'm trying to trying to get you to see, sir. Is that's exactly what we're saying. If we're all in the same faith, the Bible says there's one faith. Ephesians four four. There's one faith. So if we're all the same faith, then we should all be teaching and practicing the same thing. We should. But we're not. So that tells me that I have to be distinctive and point out the differences. Right. Now, like, for example, when you called in, you said you're a Christian. Yes, sir. But you said you're in the Baptist church. Yes, sir. Now, what I'm going to ask you is, how can you be a Christian and yet be in a church that you don't read about in the Bible? Can you tell me? I'm not going to answer that. Why not? Because I don't think it's I don't think it's important. Well, the Bible says faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. You have faith enough to be in the Baptist church, but yet you never heard anything about it and you call yourself a Christian. Absolutely. But you can't tell me why you're in a church that's not in the Bible. God didn't think enough of it to put in the Bible. Church <clears throat> is not a denomination. Church is not a building. I know church that. Is, I know that. I know that. Church listen, is I, wait, 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 anyone listen, wait a minute, wait a minute. Listen, who belongs listen, to the listen. God that believes. Okay, listen. I, I'm out of time. I'm out of time. Will you stay on the line? No, sir. You have a good night. Okay. Okay. All right, friends. That's, to me, that's very telling. Okay. I hate to hear that. Here's a man who says he's in the church. He's a Christian, but he, he won't tell why he's in the church. That's why we're doing what we're doing, friends. We've got to be plain. got to be distinctive. If it was like it was then, then he'd be able to tell us. Friends, I'm out of time. Have a good night. Legs, it has become not only a national story. Debbie Moore was telling me just a few moments ago it was on international, uh, the international version of national public radio. And there are national uh, news agencies in Rockingham County reporting on the story. We have a lot of news to cover, uh, including uh, an interview with North Carolina Governor Pat McCrory. That's coming up for you in just a few minutes.